Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis for this 20th of September 2018. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload heading your way. A lot of things going on in the news lately. I'm sure you're probably glued into what's happening with Supreme Court Justice uh, nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Um, dicey situation. Well, before we actually discuss that, because we're going to discuss Kavanaugh today, uh, we're going to go right on over to our Prager University segment. Here is a very key thing that's going to be kind of the framework of the entire show today. Watch this. It's called Left or Liberal. And we're going to splice and dice the Democratic Party. They're not like they used to be. This is not your, your father's or grandfather's Democratic Party. This is something different than that. And when you watch what's happened with the Kavanaugh hearings, take a look at left or liberal, and then you can see some of the gamesmanship that's going on in Washington right now. So let's go to Prager University right now. What's the difference between a liberal and a leftist? This question stumps most people because they think liberal and left are essentially the same. But they're not. In fact, liberalism and leftism have almost nothing in common. But the left has appropriated the word liberal so effectively, almost everyone, liberals, leftists, and conservatives, thinks they are synonymous. But they're not. Let me offer you six examples. One, race. This is probably the most obvious difference between liberal and left. The liberal position on race has always been, A, the color of a person's skin is insignificant, and B, those who believe race is significant are racists. Meanwhile, the left believes the very opposite. To the left, it's the liberal attitude toward race. It's unimportant. That is racist. That's why the University of California officially lists the statement, there is only one race, the human race, as racist. And liberals have always been passionately committed to racial integration, while the left is increasingly committed to racial segregation, such as all black dormitories and separate black graduations at universities. Two, capitalism. Liberals have always been pro-capitalism because liberals are committed to free enterprise and because they know capitalism is the only way to lift great numbers of people out of poverty. It is true that liberals want government to play a bigger role in the economy than conservatives do. But liberals never opposed capitalism, and they were never for socialism. Opposition to capitalism and advocacy of socialism are left-wing values. Three, nationalism. Liberals believe in the nation-state, whether that nation is the United States, Brazil, or France. But because the left divides the world by class rather than by national identity, the left has always opposed nationalism. So, while liberals have always wanted to protect American sovereignty and borders, the left is for open borders. When the writers of Superman were liberals, Superman was a proud American whose very motto was truth, justice, and the American way. But that all changed a few years ago when left-wing writers took over the comic strip and had Superman renounce his American citizenship to be a citizen of the world. The left has contempt for nationalism, seeing it as the road to fascism. Better that we should all be citizens of the world in a world without borders. Four, view of America. Liberals have always venerated America, Watch American films from the 1930s through the 1950s, and you will be watching overtly patriotic America-celebrating films, virtually all produced, directed, and acted by liberals. Liberals were quite aware of America's imperfections, but they agreed with Abraham Lincoln that America is the last best hope of Earth. The left, however, believes the left is the last best hope of Earth, and regards America as racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, violent, and imperialistic. Five, free speech. No one has been more committed than American liberals to the famous statement, I wholly disapprove of what you say, 
but I will defend to the death your right to say it. But the left is leading the first widespread suppression of free speech in modern American history, from the universities to the tech companies that govern the Internet to almost every other institution and place of work. Of course, the left claims to only oppose hate speech. But putting aside the fact that the left deems hate speech anything it differs with, protecting what you or I might consider hate speech is the entire point of free speech. 6. Western Civilization Liberals have always championed and sought to protect Western Civilization. Liberals celebrate the West's unique moral, philosophical, artistic, musical, and literary achievements and have taught them at virtually every university. The most revered liberal in American political history, President Franklin Roosevelt, often cited the need to protect Western civilization and even Christian civilization. Yet when President Donald Trump spoke of the need to protect Western civilization in a speech in Warsaw, the left-wing media, also known as the mainstream media, denounced him. They argued that Western civilization is no better than any other and that Western civilization is just a euphemism for white supremacy. So then, if liberalism and leftism are so different, why don't liberals oppose the left? In a nutshell, because they have been taught all their lives to fear the right. But as one of the best-known liberals in America, Harvard Law School professor Alan Dershowitz said, as a liberal, as an American, and as a Jew, I far more fear the left than the right. Dear liberals, conservatives are not your enemy. The left is. I'm Dennis Prager. To help keep these videos... That is what we're dealing with with today's modern Democratic Party. I look back at some of the older Minnesota Democrat members of Congress. I was actually thinking about them last night. Martin Olaf Sable, Bruce Vento, um, I'm trying to remember here, um, Jim Oberstar even. These guys were not your far left extremists. These are still very much left of center, but very pragmatic people. They still had the best interests of Minnesota and the best interests of America at heart. They went to Washington to serve. Not themselves necessarily, even though just by serving for 30 something years, they serve themselves in that capacity. Republicans have done that too. But they still had the best interest of America at heart. They may have differed from Republicans on policy matters, but they weren't opposed to making friends with the Republicans. They didn't feel the need to exclude and isolate them from everything. They worked together on Capitol Hill. When you look at their replacements, Keith Ellison, Penny McCollum, Rick Nolan, he's still one of the older guard, even though he's trying to kind of morph into the left. You know, it's a dying breed. Look at the last presidential race with Jim Webb. Jim Webb ran as a Democrat. He was a Democrat U.S. Senator. And he was shunned because he actually embraced some of the ideals of the right. Not true, not so with the current generation of Democrat leaders and Democrats, you know, members of Congress, House and Senate. Tina Smith is far left. Amy Klobuchar is actually far left, even though she is a very conservative person when it comes to protecting her image for making certain statements and certain stands. But when you look at her voting record, she votes right there with Chuck Schumer and really does whatever Chuck Schumer tells her to do. She endorses Keith Ellison. Now, she'll come in and talk against Judge Kavanaugh, but she'll embrace Keith Ellison. That brings me into the heart of today's discussion. Because we've had Supreme Court nominee, Judge uh, Brett Kavanaugh. His confirmation hearing started uh, earlier in the month. 
We're not going to actually show you a lot about what happened as far as this Q&A is concerned. Q&A, that happens with everybody. The judges pretty much don't really tell you anything. Senators, most of them pontificate on their own pet things anyway. Most of the people have already made up their mind before they even walked into the halls of Congress for the hearing. But what we're going to show you is the circus that this became. We're going to show you, starting right now, the introductory gavel and how Chairman Chuck Grassley couldn't even utter his first full paragraph before the Democrats, the far-left Democrats, became obstructionist. Let's go to the video. Good morning. I welcome everyone to this confirmation hearing on the nomination of Mr. Judge Chairman Brett Kavanaugh. Mr. Chairman, to serve as Associate Justice. Mr. Chairman, I'd like Supreme to be recognized for a United question States. before we proceed. Regular order, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be recognized to ask a question before we proceed. The committee received just last night, less than 15 hours ago. 42,000 pages of documents that we have not had an opportunity to review or read or analyze. You are out, you're out of order. I'll proceed. We cannot possibly move forward, Mr. Chairman. I with extend this a very warm welcome to Judge Kavanaugh. We have not been given Kavanaugh an opportunity to have a meaningful his wife, hearing Ashley, on the nominee. There are two daughters. Mr. Chairman, I agree with my colleague, friends. Senator Harris. Mr. Chairman, Judge we received 42,000 documents that we haven't been able else to review us last today. night, and we believe this hearing should be postponed. I know this is an exciting day for all of you here, Mr. Chairman. and you're rightly proud Mr. Chairman, of Chairman, if, if we cannot be recognized, I move to adjourn. The American people Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. To directly from Judge Kavanaugh and later this afternoon. Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. And I'm, Mr. Chairman, we have been denied we have been denied real access to the documents we need to advise. Mr. Chairman, the regular order is called for. Which turns this hearing into a charade and a mockery of our norms. Well, and Mr. Chairman, I therefore move to adjourn this hearing. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask for a roll call vote on my motion to adjourn. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. I ask for a roll call vote. Uh, we're not in executive session. We will continue as planned. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized, sir? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I appeal to the chair to recognize myself or one of my colleagues. You're out of order. Mr. Chairman, I, I appeal to be recognized on your sense of decency and integrity. I, even the documents you have requested, Mr. Chairman, even the ones that you said, the limited documents you have requested, mm -hmm. this committee has not received. And the documents we have, you, sir, have Mr. labeled Chairman, committee confidential. They should be transparent. This committee, sir, is a violation of even the values I've heard you talk about time and time again, the ideals that we should have. What is the rush? What, what are we trying to hide by not having the documents out front? What is with the rush? What are we hiding by not letting those documents come out? 
Sir, this committee is a violation of the values that we as a committee have striven for, transparency. We are rushing through this process in a way that is unnecessary. And I, I appeal for the motion to at least be voted on. Mr. Chairman. At least let's have a vote, because when we wrote you a letter on August 24th Senator. asking to, to have a meeting on this issue, you denied us even the right to meet. So here we are having a meeting. Let's at least debate this issue. Let's at least call this for a vote. I, I appeal to your sense of fairness and decency, your commitments that you've made to transparency. This violates what you have even said and called for, sir. You've called for documents, you yourself, limited documents. We thought there should be more. We have not received the documents that you have even called for. So, sir, based upon your own principles, your own values, I call for at least to have a, a debate or a vote on these issues and not for us to rush through this process. <laughs> Mr. 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 Chairman, Senator, Mr. Chairman, Senator, I've heard calls for I'd like to regular respond, order. I'd, I'd like to respond to Senator Booker. Senator Booker, I think that uh, I respect very much a lot of things you you uh, you do, but you spoke about my decency and my and you spoke about my decency and integrity, and I think you're ta uh, you are taking advantage of my decency and integrity. So. Mr. Chairman, it is also... I hope you notice something there. Mr. Chairman, Every time the protesters started yelling, it was always when Cory Booker was speaking, the senator from New Jersey. How can you actually conduct a uh, process, and everybody knew about the process, and this is not the first time that people in that chamber have gone through the process without rules and a sense of order. Now. When I say that, this is not a slight on Chairman Grassley, and he explains in just a little bit about why he has been as patient as he is. I thought being a U.S. Senator meant that you were supposed to, at least in the eyes of the public, you're supposed to have some sense of statesmanship and decorum. I've been to circuses, literally the ones with elephants, that have more decorum in the way... and that they handled themselves from both performers and spectators than what we saw in the halls of the U.S. Senate. And that is your Democratic Party at work, folks. This is what they do. They obstruct. Chairman Grassley couldn't even say, welcome to Judge Kavanaugh, and the Democrats are already objecting. There was nothing there to object over. Oh, we didn't get these many documents. In a little bit, you're going to find out how many documents actually were given. Oh, we didn't have time to read them. Didn't seem to have any problems with the Republican committee members reading them. Only the Democrats. There's even more to that coming up. So right now, we're going to go to more Democrat objections. Literally, right now. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it is also... I think Mr. That Chairman, I, it is also not regular uh, order for the majority Sen to Senator require Romo. the minority to pre-clear our questions, our documents, and the videos we would like to use at this hearing. That is unprecedented. That is not regular order. Since no. when do we have to submit the questions and the, the process that we wish to follow to question this nominee? So I'd like your clarification. I'd Senator like your response Rono, on why you are requesting I would that ask that you, to submit uh, our questions to I you. ask that you uh, stop so we can conduct this hearing the way we have planned it. Uh, maybe it isn't going exactly the way that the minority would like to have it go, but we, we have said for a long period of time that we were going to proceed on this very day, and I think we ought to give the American people the opportunity to hear whether Judge Kavanaugh should be on the Supreme Court or not. And uh, you have heard my side of the aisle call for regular order, and I think we ought to proceed in regular order. There will be plenty of opportunities to respond to the questions that the minority is legit, leg, 
legitimately raising, and we will uh, we will proceed accordingly. Mr. Mr. Chairman, under under regular order, may I ask a point of order, which is that we are now presented with a situation in which somebody has decided that there are 100,000 documents protected by executive privilege, yet there has not been an assertion of executive privilege before the committee. How are we to determine whether executive privilege has been properly asserted if this hearing goes by without the committee ever considering that question? Why is it not in regular order for us to determine before the hearing at which the documents would be necessary, whether or not the assertion of privilege that prevents us from getting those documents is legitimate or indeed is even an actual assertion of executive privilege. I do not understand why that is not a legitimate point of order at this point, because at the end of this hearing, it is too late to consider it. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I might add to this, on the integrity of the documents we've received, there, there really is no integrity. They have alterations, they have oddities, attachments are missing, emails are cut off halfway through a chain, recipients' names are missing. Uh, the uh, many are of, of interest to this committee, but it's cut off. We, the National Archives, hasn't had a chance to get us all that we want, even though you sit on your website. The National Archives would act as a check against any political interference. But I, I, I check after the hearing is over, there's no check. I think we ought to at least have the National Archives finish it. And to have, for the first time, certainly in my 44 years here, to have somebody say there's a claim of executive privilege when the president hasn't made such a claim just puts everything under doubt. What are we trying to hide? Why are we rushing? I can answer all the questions that have been raised, but I think if I answer those questions, it's going to fit into the effort of the minority to continue to obstruct. And I don't think that that's fair to our judge. It's not fair to our constitutional process. But let me, uh, let me respond to those uh, now, and then maybe we can proceed. Uh, my colleagues on the other side are accusing the administration of using executive privilege to hide documents from the committee. I want to say why they're wrong. Uh, unlike President Obama's assertion of executive privilege during Fast and Furious is one example, this assertion is not legitimate. Judge Kavanaugh was a senior lawyer in the White House. He advised the president on judicial nominations, provided legal advice on separation of powers issues, and handled litigation matters. As the, as the Supreme Court has put it, quote, unless the president can give his advisors some assurance of confidentiality, a president could not expect to receive the full and frank submissions of facts and opinions upon which the effective discharge of his duties depends, end of quote. The issues Judge Kavanaugh worked on are exactly the sort of issues that require, according to the Supreme Court, some assurance of confidentiality. We in the Senate and everyone else in America expect exactly the same sort of confidentiality. Most senators would not agree to turn over their staff's communication to anyone. For example, we didn't ask that Judge Kagan's records for her service with then-Senator Biden be turned over during her nomination. And because of attorney-client privilege, everybody has a right to keep communications from their lawyers out of government hands. We therefore didn't ask for Justice Ginsburg's documents from her time with the ACLU. We didn't ask for Judge Sotomayor's, Sotomayor's uh, confidential documents from her time in private practice. It can't be that the Senate and the ACLU are entitled to more protection than the President of the United States. 
and then I will speak to the fact about 42,000 pages. Last night, we received additional documents for the committee's review. These were documents we requested before the hearing, and we received them before the hearing just as we requested. The majority staff began re reviewing the documents as soon as they arrived and has already completed its review. There is thus absolutely no reason, uh, that's no reason to delay, delay the hearing. We have received and read every page of Judge Kavanaugh's extensive public record. This includes 12 years of his judicial service on the most important federal circuit court in the country, where he authored 307 opinions and joined hundreds more, amounting to more than 10,000 pages of judicial writing. We, all re we also received and read more than 17,000 pages of his speeches, articles, teaching materials, other documents that Judge Kavanaugh submitted with his questionnaire, the most robust questionnaire this committee has ever issued. And of course, we received and read more than 483,000 pages of documents from Judge Kavanaugh's extensive executive branch service. This is more pages than the last five Supreme Court nominees combined. In short, this committee has more materials for Judge Kavanaugh's nomination than we have had on any Supreme Court nominee in history. Senators have had more than enough time and materials to adequately assess Judge Kavanaugh's com uh, qualifications, and so that's why I proceed. I know that this is an exciting day for all of you in the family and all the people that are close to Judge Kavanaugh. And you're rightly proud of the judge. The American people get to hear directly from Judge Kavanaugh later this afternoon. After this confirmation hearing and process is finished, I expect Judge Kavanaugh will become the next Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Welcome again, Judge. Before I begin, I would uh, want to give you, Judge, an opportunity to introduce your family. Before I... And so that was the moment in time after all of that, after all of that, Judge Kavanaugh finally had a chance to actually say thank you for allowing me to be here. Here are my family members present. And then we went right back uh, into more of the same. Uh, Chairman Grassley had read off the rules of the hearing, and I think this is important for understanding the process. Let's take a look. Before I make my opening remarks, I want to set out the ground rules for the hearing. I want everyone to be able to watch the hearing without obstruction. Uh, if people stand up and block the view of those behind them or speak out of turn, it's not fair or considerate to others. So officers will immediately remove those individuals and I thank the officers for doing the work that they have to do. We'll have 10 minute rounds of opening statements with each member, the ranking member and I may go a little over 10 minutes, but I'm going to ask everyone else to limit your remarks to those 10 minutes. I hope everyone will respect that. We plan on taking a 15 minute break after Senator Cruz's opening statement. After all the opening statements by senators are complete, we'll take another 15 minute round break to turn to our introducers who will formally present the judge. After that, I'll administer the oath to the judge and we'll close that portion of today's hearing with his testimony. Mr. Tomorrow Chairman, morning. Mr. Chairman, when will we review Senator Blumenthal's motion to adjourn? What's your question? I, I renew my motion to adjourn, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I think we're entitled to a vote yeah. on it. Yeah. The, the responses that, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, you've given with all due respect really fly in the face of the norms of this committee, our traditions, and our rules. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I might add an additional point, I agree with my colleague. It is striking given your long history of encouraging the executive branch to treat minority requests equal with majority requests that you discourage the National Archives from responding uh, to Ranking Member Feinstein's request, which she tried to craft with you to be identical to the request for records from Justice Kagan. Um, we should not be proceeding until we have the full documents that allow us to review the judge's record.
records. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, last Friday we learned that nearly 102,000 pages of documents from Judge Kavanaugh's work in the White House Counsel's Office are being withheld from the committee and the public based on a claim of constitutional privilege. Executive privilege has never been invoked to block the release of presidential records to the Senate during a Supreme Court nomination. This includes when Justice Kagan was nominated to the Supreme Court, as well as Justice Roberts. Yesterday, my colleagues and I sent a letter to the White House Counsel asking that the President withdraw his claim of privilege over these documents so that they can be made available to this committee and to the American people. We have not yet received a response to that letter, so we should not be proceeding until we have a response and these documents have been available. It is 102,000 documents. And Mr. Chairman, my motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman, would raise this issue of executive privilege and whether it has been properly asserted for reasons that have been outlined well by my colleague, Senator Whitehouse. There is no valid claim here of executive privilege. Even if there were one, it has not been properly asserted. The question is, what is the administration afraid of showing the American people? What is it trying to hide? And Mr. Chairman, using your own words in the statement you just read, you said, I quote, We've had more than enough time to review the documents. Sir, we just got a document dump last night of over 40,000 pages. I would venture to say not one senator here has had time to read through those 40,000 pages. And so we are continuing to rush through this process, a process that deserves to be scrutinized. I support Senator Blumenthal's motion for, to adjourn, and I hope that we could at least uh, have a vote on that motion. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a court in the country that would not give a party litigant a continuance when the party on the other side did a 42,000-page document dump after close of business the night before trial. Mr. Chairman, we waited for more than a year with a vacancy on the Supreme Court under the direction of your leader in the United States Senate, and the Republic survived. I think the treatment was shabby of Merrick Garland and President Obama's nominee. The fact that we cannot take a few days or weeks to have a complete review of Judge Kavanaugh's record is unfair to the American people. It's inconsistent with our responsibility under Section Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution to advise and consent on Supreme Court nominees. Um, Senator Cornyn. You want to speak? I, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just, I'll be very brief. I would just say that um, Senator Whitehouse has suggested that we handle this hearing like a court of law, but I would suggest that if this were a court of law, that virtually every side, every member of the, on the dais on the, that side would be held in contempt of court. Oh, come on. Because this whole process is supposed to be a civil one where people get to ask questions and we get to get answers. And that's the basis upon which we are to exercise our constitutional responsibilities of advice and consent. So I would just suggest we get on with the hearing. Cornyn is absolutely right. This is supposed to be a civil process. But there's no civility when it comes to the left-wing Democrats. I don't see liberal Democrats. I see that far progressive left element. We're going to obstruct, 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 we're going to make a complete circus out of this hearing. We're going to have our friendly protesters in the back completely, you know, scream and yell and try to shut down the process. What good is that? The only thing that that does is it just serves to upset people. It really does. Just like the anti-war protesters who shut down roads, uh, like when we uh, had the war in Iraq, didn't stop the war in Iraq, just inconvenienced a lot of people. Or the Black Lives Matter protests shutting down freeways so the people that might actually be sympathetic to their cause can't go to wherever they need to go. Protests like this only seem to turn rational people away from the cause. And they don't get that. They just don't. Perhaps if the Democrats actually did a cost-benefit analysis they would realize that what they're doing is costing them seats. It's costing them power. The more they obstruct, the more upset the American people get. Because what do the people want? The people actually want unity. They don't necessarily mean that they've got to get along, but they want to see that the process works. 
And if the process is broken, they get very upset. Voters do take backlashes at the polls. They do. It happens all the time. There is no civility here, and that's what's missing. So now we have another exchange from Chairman Grassley and Senator Booker. If uh, my Mr. colleagues, Mr. Chairman, I could just respond. If, if my, Mr. If, Chairman, if I could just respond. Chairman, if we could I just would, respond to that. I would, uh, sir. You, uh, can, you can respond, but just a minute. If people wonder why the chair is so patient during this whole process, I have found that it takes longer to argue why you shouldn't do anything than let people argue why they want it. These things are going to be said throughout this hearing. We're going to be in session Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, till we get done this week. So however long people want to take, we're going to uh, not necessarily accommodate all obstruction, but if people got something to say, this chairman's going to let them say it. But it, it gets pretty boring to hear the same thing all the time. Senator Booker, make it quick, please. I really appreciate uh, the, the deference, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question was why would we want to delay this? And this is not an attempt to delay. Uh, this is an attempt to be fully equipped to do our constitutional duty, which everybody, Republicans and Democrats on this committee, take seriously. It, it is very hard to perform our role of advice and consent when we do not have a thorough vetting of the background of the candidate in areas which he, the candidate himself has referred to as the most formative part of his legal career where he himself has talked about how important this period of his life is, we're denied the full vetting. And sir, this is not something that Democrats are asking for. I remind you that you yourself asked for a limited set of documents for when he was in the White House Counsel's office. You yourself set that standard. And even on that limited standard, sir, we have not received the documents. And then even the documents, we've received 7% of them, Almost half of those have been labeled committee confidential that cannot put, be put before the American people, which further undermine and inhibit our ability to ask questions to thoroughly vet this candidate and advise and consent the President of the United States. So, sir, just on, on the basic ideals of fairness, the traditions of this body, we should have a thorough understanding of the nominee that's put before us so that we can vet them. To go into this hearing without those documents is an undermining of the constitutional role to which we have all sworn an oath to upheld, uphold. Mr. Chairman, I have great respect for my colleague from Texas. I would like to respond to Senator Booker, and then Senator Feinstein has asked for the floor. Uh, I'd like to, I'd Mr. Like Chairman, to I asked to, to respond to, to my to colleague to from Senator Booker. Texas. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Booker. Using a standard set by two members of your political party in the caucus, and I'm going to phrase because I don't have the exact quotes in front of me, but recently Senator Schumer said from the floor, the best uh, judge of whether or not somebody should be on the Supreme Court is decisions that they've made at lower courts. Senator. Uh, Leahy said something similar to that when Senator Sotomayor was before us, that uh, we, know how, we know how many, uh, we know what you have done in a lower court. That's the best basis for knowing whether or not you ought to be on the Supreme Court. So we have 307 cases that this nominee has written decisions on as a basis for that. And, uh, and uh, we've, we've got 488,000 other pages, and maybe the senators haven't read them, but their staff is fully informed because last night before 11 o'clock on the 42,000 pages that have come to our attention, the staff on the Republican side has gone through them. But, sir, then why did you ask for the White House counsel documents? Senator, they were not germane to this hearing. Why would you even ask for them? Senator Feinstein. And so there you have it, more, more fireworks. Notice that the one person we haven't heard anything from was Judge Kavanaugh. 
This process went on for over an hour. As a matter of fact, uh, it went on for one hour and 38 minutes. And the only thing we ever heard from Judge Kavanaugh himself was, hi, thank you for inviting me here, and here's my family. I didn't even play that clip simply because it was not germane. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Now, granted that, according to the rules set by the chairman, that every member of the Senate committee had 10 minutes to expand upon their opening remarks. So, that's fine. Do you know when we got to opening remarks? 90 minutes into the process. It took 90 minutes before we heard uh, Chairman Grassley's statement, we heard Dianne Feinstein's statement, 90 minutes before we got to that point. A little ridiculous, don't you think? Well, here's another uh, quick exchange between uh, Senator John Kennedy, the Republican from Louisiana, asking the chairman a question. Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I have a question about the process. I understand my colleague's point, and I understand they feel strongly about this. But what are going to be the ground rules today? Are we going to be allowed to interrupt each other, interrupt a witness? Yeah. Are we going to, should we seek recognition from the chair? I just want to understand the ground rules. Proper, proper respect and decorum plus how we normally have done business in a hearing like this. We wouldn't be having all these motions. You're new to the Senate. So this is something I've never gone through before in 15 Supreme Court nominations that I have been since I've been on here. And every member, bef uh, I was interrupted before I got to a chance to say what the agenda for today, but every member is going to get uh, 10 minutes to make their remarks. And then we will uh, go to the introducers of uh, Judge Kavanaugh, there will be three of those. They will take the usual time of introducers. And then we will have the swearing in of Judge Kavanaugh. And then we will have his uh, opening remarks. And then we will adjourn for today. We'll reconvene at 9.30 on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, each member will have 30 minutes to ask questions or make all these points they're making right now. Uh, uh, for each, the first round, then there will be a second round of 20 minutes each. So every member is going to get 50 minutes to ask all the questions or make all the statements that they want to make uh, in regard to anything about this candidate or anything about how this meeting's being conducted. And then we will, uh, we'll, we will go late into Wednesday night or Thursday night till we get done with the questioning of Judge Kavanaugh. And then on Thursday, we're going to have three panels of six each, evenly divided for people that think Judge Kavanaugh should be on the Supreme Court and people that think he should not be on the Supreme Court. And we hopefully get that done Friday, but if we have to go Saturday and Sunday, we'll go Saturday and Sunday until we get it all done. Mr. Chairman, how can we possibly does that talk answer about- your, Does that answer your question, Senator Kennedy? Well, if I want to, yes, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Um, if I want to say something, do I need to be recognized by the chair? Uh, that would be the way that it's nice. handled. I've tried to explain to you, I'm going to be patient because sometimes if you aren't patient and you argue why something shouldn't be done, it takes longer than it does just to listen to people. But I don't think we should have to listen to the same thing three or four times. Well, patience is good, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but I just want to understand the rules. If I want to be yeah, recognized, you should be recognized. I have you can understand that I have been patient and listened to people not be recognized and speak anyway, because I would like to have this be a peaceful session. Well, before I try your patience, I'm done. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I have Chairman. a question about ground rules. And that goes to show you exactly what Chairman Grassley is trying to do. Maintain a peaceful session. That's it. Is that too much to ask? Apparently, it is. Now, uh, Senator Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina, he uh, had a comment that he made about the Democrat strategy. Let's take a look. 
Yes, I think I'll go back and forth. Senator Tillis. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I, I'm uh, confused because I heard earlier that this was a, uh, a reaction to the document releases last night, but I've, I'm reviewing a tweet from uh, NBC that said, Democrats plotted coordinated protest strategy over the holiday weekend, all agreed to disrupt and protest the hearing, sources tell me. And subsequent Dem leader, led a, uh, Chuck Schumer, led a phone call and committee members are executing now. So I just want to be clear, none of the members on this committee participated in that phone call or that strategy before the documents were released yesterday. Is this, uh, is, are you suggesting that this allegation is false? Yes, members of that committee have uh, acknowledged that they were on that phone call. And that's why we have the circus that we have. So now, uh, Senator John Cornyn from Texas, he mentions about how this much is, uh, about the, how this hearing so far has been mob rule. Let's take a look. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. I haven't been in as many confirmation hearings as some of my colleagues, but this is the first confirmation hearing for a Supreme Court justice I've seen basically according to mob rule. We have rules in the Senate. We have norms for decorum. Everybody, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, is going to get a chance to have their say. Yeah. You've given everybody a chance to ask questions for up to 50 minutes. You've given them a chance to make an opening statement. Any one of our colleagues can step out here and talk to the press and make whatever comments they want um, to the press and tell the world how they feel about this. But the fact is, it's hard to take it seriously when every single one of our colleagues in the Senate Judiciary Committee on the Democratic side have announced their opposition to this nominee even before today's hearing. So it's hard to take seriously their claim that somehow they can't do their job because they've been denied access to attorney-client or executive privilege documents when they've already made up their mind before the hearing. There's nothing fair about that. And we would just ask for an opportunity for the American people to be able to listen to this nominee uh, answer the questions that we have. And um, I think that's how we ought to proceed, and I hope we will. Mr. Mr. Chairman. And we had one other thing that happened. Just before we were able to finally start hearing the actual opening statements from the senators, Chuck Grassley lectured the Democrats. No. Mr. Chairman. Uh, can I ask my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle how long you want to, to go on with this? Because I'm not going to entertain any of the motions you're making. We're not in an executive session. And I think we ought to level with the American people. Do you want this to go on all day? because I have been patient. I've been accused of having a mob rule session. Now, if we have a mob rule session, it's because the chairman's not running the committee properly. But since every one of you on that side of the aisle, except Senator Booker, Senator Harris, new to the committee, said during Justice Gorsuch hearing, every one of you prefaced your comments on how fair I was in running that hearing. Now, this is the same Chuck Grassley that ran the Gorsuch hearing. I'd like to run this hearing the same way if you'll give me the courtesy of doing it. And that's the whole thing is courtesy. And there was none. There was no courtesy at all. It was constant objection, objection, objection. And let's talk briefly about those protesters. They were paid off. And there's actually uh, video or still images, and you can look this up online. It's out there. Uh, one woman in particular who was shown receiving a cash payment before she went into the hearing and was one of those who was protesting and made her way out of the hearing uh, under escort. More Democrat, far left obstruction. And we're going to show some of that right now because we, I'm going to show you the beginning of uh, Chairman Grassley's opening statement, but really what I want to focus on is the last few seconds of Senator Booker uh, making his final objection, and then when we get into the beginning of Chairman Grassley's formal statement. And so here we're about to go forward with just 10% of this person's record to evaluate, to base our questions on, to investigate, 
90% is being withheld, just common sense would say that that's not fair, that's not right, it undermines our ability to do our job. It is just plain wrong. One of the Senate's most solemn constitutional duties is to provide advice and consent to the President on the nomination of Supreme Court justices. We're here this week to hear from Brent Kavanaugh, to hear about his exceptional qualifications, his record of dedication to the rule of law, and his demonstrated independence, and his appreciation of the importance of the separation of powers. Indeed, to protect individual liberty, the framers designed a government of three co-equal branches, strictly separating legislative, executive, and judicial powers. The framers intended for the judiciary to be immune from the political pressures the other two face. That is, so that judges would decide cases according to the law and not according to, to uh, popular opinion. Now, 230 years after ratification, our legal system is the envy of the world. It provides our people stability, predictability, protection of our rights, and equal access to justice. But this is only possible when judges are committed to the rule of law. Our legal system's success is built on judges accepting that their role is limited to deciding cases and controversies. A good judge exercises humility and makes decisions according to specific facts of the case and, of course, according to the law. A good judge never a, a, a good judge never bases decisions on his preferred policy preferences. A, a good judge also has courage, recognizing that we have an independent judiciary to restrain judges when that government exceeds lawful authority. President Andrew Jackson said, quote, all the rights secured to the citizens under the Constitution are worth nothing and a mere bubble except guaranteed to them by an independent and virtuous judiciary, end of quote. Confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominees are an independent... So... Chairman Grassley was finally able to get into his statements, but this, uh, do you, just from hearing these screams, do you have a headache yet? This went on for an hour and a half. The thing is, that was just the first hour and a half. It didn't stop. This, folks, is the last gasp, desperation from your progressive far left. They know what's coming. They can't stand it, they can't stop it, and they know that. That's why you have the obstruction. The fact is, these people are not your friends, and they don't represent you. They represent themselves, and they represent the socialist communist agenda. Now, when they couldn't actually stop the hearing, what happened? The hearing continued. We had the Q&A exchange. We had all the senator statements. And then, lo and behold, we had a sexual harassment bombshell for an incident that happened 36 years before with an accuser who can't remember exactly whether or not it was even Kavanaugh to begin with and goes to a Democrat senator on July 30th and then conveniently, middle of September, this gets up there. But it's a, a serious issue, and it is a serious issue, but it's not serious enough to bring it up on July 30th. You have to wait six weeks? Calls for all to testify after an FBI investigation? Excuse me, what is this? Kavanaugh has been um, vetted by the FBI six times? 
it never showed up on an investigation, a background check. This is another 11th hour left-wing attack to try to stop and delay the Kavanaugh hearings. And frankly, I don't think it's going to work. This kind of reminds me of something that happened in 1991. And let's hear from a Supreme Court nominee who had the exact same thing happen to him 27 years ago. Senator, I would like to start by saying unequivocally, uncategorically, that I deny each and every single allegation against me today that suggested in any way that I had conversations of a sexual nature or about pornographic material with Anita Hill, that I ever attempted to date her, that I ever had any personal sexual interest in her, or that I in any way ever harassed her. A second, and I think more important point, I think that this today is a travesty. I think that it is disgusting. I think that this hearing should never occur in America. This is a case in which this sleaze, this dirt, was searched for by staffers of members of this committee, was then leaked to the media, and this committee and this body validated it and displayed it at prime time over our entire nation. How would any member on this committee, any person in this room, or any person in this country would like sleaze said about him or her in this fashion, or this dirt dredged up in this gossip and these lies displayed in this manner? How would any person like it? The Supreme Court is not worth it. No job is worth it. I'm not here for that. I'm here for my name, my family, my life, and my integrity. I think something is dreadfully wrong with this country when any person, any person in this free country would be subjected to this. This is not a closed room. There was an FBI investigation. This is not an opportunity to talk about difficult matters privately or in a closed environment. This is a circus. It's a national disgrace. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves to have different ideas. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the US, US Senate rather than hung from a tree. And that's exactly what the far left is trying to do now. They went back and dusted off the 1991 playbook, and here we are. They're giving it to Judge Kavanaugh. We'll see what happens. I think Kavanaugh will get confirmed, but if he doesn't, Amy Comey, uh, Coney Barrett is probably going to be replacing him. Uh, anyhow, that's our show for now. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.